the ZWO AM5 mount has been, it's, it's a fantastic piece of equipment. I absolutely love it. I do not regret the decision of selling my EQ6R Pro, which was modded, by the way, and ran fantastically for the AM5. But it does have some issues and some challenges. If you look on the internet, you'll see that it, there is guiding results are kind of hit and miss. And uh, some people are extremely frustrated with uh, the support from ZWO. And there's a lot of uh, white papers, per se, that kind of explain things what's going on. So I did some stuff to mine. I've been getting great results. So let's talk about it in like a part two review here. So I'm Chad. This is the Easy Astro Images channel. And we are going to talk about the AM5 tonight. What's going on? I hope everybody is doing just awesome out there today. Now, the ZWO AM5 has, like I said, been pretty kind of hit and miss for people. From what I can tell in my own personal experience, if you use this thing with an ASI Air, 95% of the time, you're going to have a fantastic experience because even at the default settings, which really don't make a whole lot of sense after reading through some of the extensive research that people have done, but mine seems to have guided really, really well, uh, especially after I had done the actual tripod mod. So we'll talk about the actual carbon fiber tripod. It's a great piece of equipment. It is super duper easy and light and everything else. But if you are in any kind of wind at all, um, you just are going to have issues. Uh, polar alignment has was also kind of difficult because it does just kind of move and sway just enough to kind of throw things out of alignment. So the AM5, when it is on the tripod and the pier, I mean, look, for what it is and how much it weighs, this thing is, is extremely sturdy. But when you have any kind of wind gust at all, um, five to 10 miles per hour, I mean, honestly, the guiding performance does begin to suffer. So we're gonna move everything over to the AVX tripod. Heavier two inch steel legs, Astro Blender did a video on how to do this. It's a pretty simple process. So what we have here is the stuff from the AVX that I took out and we have a 3 8 inch of uh, 12, uh, 16 inch rod, I'm sorry. Uh, so a 3 8 inch uh, fender washer, an E-clip to keep the pole from sliding down and we have a 3 8 inch fluted knob. Now 3 8 is slightly smaller or pretty close to 10 millimeters. So we'll actually be able to thread this up right through the AVX mount, tighten everything on. It'll fit right into the hole here. The hole underneath here on the AM5 mount is 3 8 of an inch. So that is the plan. We're gonna get all this stuff installed right now. And of course, we won't be able to test it tonight, but hey, that's life. Everything is on here and this thing is super duper solid. This is definitely going to work out. It's pretty amazing that just one threaded rod could hold everything on there so well. You can see I have it on my casters now, so if I need to roll it out, I can. But uh, honestly, you know, this is uh, still pretty light. So even with the red cat and stuff on there, should be just fine. But yep, we are, we're good to go here. So the weight increase was very, very minimal. I mean, it's a pretty obvious all the weight is in the actual mount and the counterweight when you're dealing with an AVX. The install was perfect. I can still carry this thing out everywhere. I've got a ton more stability. Now, if you don't have an AVX mount lying around, I know a lot of people don't. They don't sell it separately that I can find. But if you go on to like an AM5 forum or somewhere on Facebook, the AM5 user groups, a lot of people are finding solutions to do this. And... If you're a new shopper for an AM5, I would totally just skip the mount and take that three or 400 bucks between that and the pier and extension and stuff and put that towards something else. Um, you're not going to gain a lot of weight, but you are going to gain incredible stability. So let's go over uh, the guiding settings and the stuff from the last imaging cycle that I had. Uh, things have been going great for multiple nights, even with wind and stuff, and I'm not having to do anything crazy like 
put up barriers or block it or anything silly like that. But it's definitely worth looking, you know, at these white papers. And I, a lot of people have been talking about this guy on this VWO, ZWO form, uh, Mr. Chen. And, you know, he really takes it to ZWO to like kind of tell them what's up and explain things. And he talks about all about adjusting like things like your calibration step and just all the things that you have to do to make a strain wave basically work with PHD2. From the way that I can understand it, you know, PHD2 actually is not optimized very well to work with strain wave uh, to gear mounts. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. Now, I know a lot of us, including myself, watch Quiv, Quiv the Lazy Geek, and, you know, he was able to throw... Um, his out on his balcony and uh, just throw the default settings and really not have any issues at all. But he also was running predictive pack and admitted to that in his video and wasn't having any issues at all either. So you can just see that there's just not, there's a lot of variability in the results and everything that you can get to. But uh, the stuff that I have done in PhD2 after going through all of this information seems to be the best way to calibrate and, and just guide, you know, with the high frequency type of stuff that's going on. So I'll show you an example of what uh, my guiding and uh, imaging session looked like the other night. Now, the very first thing I did was a complete deinstall redo of PHD2 to start everything over with the guide wizard and set everything up again, proper focal, focal length and all of that kind of stuff, all original defaults. I also refocused the camera, lowered the gain and added an IR uh, filter. Uh, I wasn't getting better results out of bin two. So I went back to bin one, used the IR cut filter on the actual, um, you know, guide camera and was getting a pretty dang good results, that is for sure. Now, if we take a look here at the actual uh, setup that we had going on, you can see all of my different uh, functions down here. Uh, the most important to think about is the, you know, I was guiding here at uh, a half a second. And in order to get that calibrated correctly, I needed to go in and actually change my calibration uh, steps um, and advanced settings. This is a look at everything here, but I uh, wanted to change and make sure the calibration steps were set up correctly. Um, we changed the actual aggressions like way down to like 35. It seems to be the consensus on both and kind of work your way up. And then we also changed uh, the maximum RA and deck values to 250, which is half of your guiding exposure. So if you want to guide at one second, then you're going to want to set those at like 500. Um, you know, you can see that obviously it was a clear night and everything was just, you know, working really well. This is my on uh, board camera here that is riding in front, just a simple uh, 120 MC Pro. And I use that to collect the light and everything and just kind of examine my imaging session throughout the night. And you can see we we're getting some pretty dang good exposures of the Jellyfish Nebula guiding, you know, running anywhere between like 0.65 and like 0.85. Um, and it was pretty much like that for the entire four hours. Uh, typically before that I would get durations of guiding and it would kind of like go all over the place. And I've seen other people mention this too, that the thing would guide like perfectly for like five minutes and then it would just kind of lose its mind and you would run up to like 1.5, 2.0 for like five minutes and then kind of settle back in. And some people would say, well, maybe that's just the way the strain wave gear is like, you know, moving and how PHD two is coping with it. There's a lot of information in that stuff, just way more for me to be able to digest. But I definitely, you know, would recommend that you take a look at it. Um, there's talk about like what maybe to set your min movement sets to. Um, again, we're doing a high frequency type of guide. So you really want to try to correct before that, it sounds like. So the half second to one second exposure, changing your maximums to like 250, um, you know, doing your calibration that way, getting a good calibration and the whole tripod, just the whole culmination of everything. I didn't honestly think I was going to have to put 
this much work into it to get like these kind of results. But you know, you can see here for yourself, you know, the results speak for themselves. Everything was just going super well. And there was, you know, there was a little bit of wind out there that night, like nothing crazy, but you know, the, the thing was locked on. It was doing very well. And I collected some really great data. So I hope that these kind of settings can help you guys out a little bit. You know, we're doing hysteria, uh, hysteresis on both axes. Um, if you find yourself having problems with overshoot or undershoot, I mean, I obviously probably could have tailored this a little bit more. Um, you really want to focus on one axis at a time. Um, some people will say try to dial in your RA first. Some people will say try to, uh, to do the deck. Um, also, uh, deck backlash is another thing that you do want to turn on. Um, if you want to run a guiding assistant uh, to get a more accurate measurement of uh, the deck uh, backlash, you can do that as well. I haven't done that yet. I just turned it on, and I think it added like... 20 whatever that is 20 milliseconds or 20 what at pixel 20 i don't know what it is can't remember but it adds that in there to kind of compensate for everything so just a lot of little things to kind of get this thing up and going properly in my opinion so again this whole system works perfectly in perfect conditions and i'm have yet to try these settings in my ASI Air Plus. Um, I'm definitely going to change them despite the fact that it worked really good. Um, but I just know that this is what uh, this is what works. So we're going to try it in the ASI Air eventually. And uh, I think we'll be just fine. So if you guys want to use Nina and all that kind of fun stuff um, with your AM5, you know, we've proved that it all works really well, but there's also, you could run into some challenges. Hopefully these settings can help. And if you have any questions about the settings, um, you know, let me know, but just a couple basic things there to, to change. You can uh, look at and copy there. So we'll talk to you guys later. Appreciate all of you. Peace.